you're watching news from Kazakhstan. It is Tuesday, November 27th. These are the headlines. Suspension. Court suspends publication of Zgad newspaper and Al Khad party's activities until court proceedings. Who is behind the opposition media and political organizations blockade? Instructions. Head of Sambu Kazana Fund urges managers not to succumb to employees' demands to raise wages without dire need. Shiny happy people. Money for veterans, holiday suits for newborns. Excitement in Astana over upcoming presidential holiday. Enter week two of court proceedings over murdered and burned Arkan Kirgan border outpost soldiers. The defendant, Vladislav Chelok, refused to take part in the trial and is absent from the courtroom. Video from the crime scene was examined on Monday, November 26. However, participants filed out of the room one by one, horrid by what they saw. We turn to our first story for more. The sixth day of Vladislav Chelok's trial started off with yet another legal speech of the defense lawyer. Serik Sarsenov voiced an objection to the unlawful actions of the judge. I perceive these actions as elements of power abuse and obstruction of advocacy. The defendant, Vladislav Chelok, didn't attend yesterday's court session. He refused to watch the video from the scene of the tragic event. The five-hour police footage of medical examinations, soldiers clearing the debris and removing chaired corpses and body parts was shown to the families of the killed border guards. One of the deceased soldiers' mother was taken bad by the horrors she saw. I couldn't bear watching it any longer. There is nothing but ashes left of our sons. We, the parents, want Vladislav to stand in front of us, look into our eyes and answer our questions. Then we will see if he is guilty of the murder. During the break, Chelok's mother, Svetlana Vashenko, commented on the video that came as a bombshell last week, revealing her son's confessions to a fellow inmate. I can tell for sure that this evidence was fabricated as the video and voice records do not match. The video was made back in Ucharal and the false confession audio track was added to it later. The video with gruesome details caused the families of the killed border guards to leave the courtroom in close succession. Karlagash Mukashev, the mother of Nurlanbek Mukashev, filed a move to refuse further participation in court proceedings and will get back to the courtroom only to hear the sentence. Another soldier's mother, Tatiana Ray, shared her opinion on Chelok's involvement. I deeply resent the implication that our children were cowards hiding under beds and harassing fellow soldiers. We just don't believe that. My son was a healthy, six feet tall young man, keen on hockey and soccer. I don't think he would ever engage in bullying Chelok. The court session continued today, however, according to Serik Sarsenov, Vladislav Chelik is unlikely to start testifying before the next week. Kazakhstan is the land of state secrets. Where is convicted Al-Ha party leader Vladimir Kozlov, who was meant to be transported under guard and stand trial over the prosecutor general's lawsuit against his association? These are questions with no clear answers. Our reporters attempted to find out the whereabouts of the politician and when to expect the trial over Al-Ha party, which is labeled extremist by law enforcement officials. For already more than three days, the spouse of Alga party leader Vladimir Kozlov, sentenced to seven and a half years in prison, has been kept in the dark regarding his whereabouts. Kozlov was scheduled to be escorted to the prison at the end of last week, but the exact location of the settlement was not disclosed. Also, the politician received another sentence extension before the transfer. On the night of November 23rd, the head of the Mangistau Regional Correctional Department came to Kozlov cell with another man and searched the premise. Allegedly, they found some illegal items which resulted in 10 days of solitary confinement. He spent the day before the transfer there. Max Bakayev, a member of Alga party, says he tried to find Vladimir Kozlov at the station in Atarau. We saw two prison trucks and convoy people at the station. When a Mangistau train arrived, some men were taken off it and placed in the paddy wagon. In turn, several people were taken to the train. We shouted for Vladimir, but no one answered, and we were not allowed to come any closer. Alga party activists have been going from court to court in the last few days. Apparently, locating a lawsuit brought against someone is not an easy task in Kazakhstan. Party members have the official note. However, it is too vague to understand who will be accountable in the end. On top of 
that, Alga is not even a registered legal entity. It is not clear who is the accused party in this case. Secondly, there are some regulations that we must follow, and if we violate them, we will immediately face liability, including criminal. The answers could be found in court only. Beside other charges, the supposed extremists were also accused of low moral values. They just handed us the ruling, although there are no proceedings at the moment. Only one thing absolutely clear at this moment is that the hearing will start on November 29th in the Almaty District Court. Ostende Court in Almaty suspends publication of Zgladen Business newspaper and forbids it from publishing its content on social networks. Our colleagues, who are being labeled extremists along with other independent media in Kazakhstan, made the announcement at a press conference. More on the popular publication's fate up next. According to government agencies, the opposition newspaper of Zgliad cannot be distributed in hard copy or online. Just a half an hour before the press conference, the newspaper staff learned that the judge of the Almaty Bostandik District Court has already ruled to suspend publication. Prior to the press conference, we raised our files and it appears that most complaints deal with third-party comments. As such, they do not reflect the opinion of the editorial board and were needed to compile articles. Thus, we believe this action to be unreasonable. Chief editor of Zgliad newspaper Igor Vinyavsky joined the press conference live from Warsaw. Vinyavsky considers to continue distributing Zgliad but not as a newspaper and rather as a social media digest. Journalists now count on the reaction and support of the European Parliament and international human rights organizations, although the present situation is not very promising. The court decision was addressed to the Ministry of Culture and Information, directing them to suspend the circulation of the newspaper. I suppose the bailiff department received one as well. Even if we still release the ready issue, it is unlikely it will ever reach the public. Right now, the only option left for the regular readers of Zgliad is the internet, says Igor Vinyavsky. In the meantime, the staff continues to work normally on a new issue of a newspaper deemed extremist by the state prosecutor. The British Daily Mail knows who is behind the clampdowns of Kazakhstan's mass media. The publication believes it is the former British Prime Minister and head of the Labour Party, Tony Blair, who is currently a highly paid economic advisor of the President of Kazakhstan. Tony Blair is directly linked to the closure of opposition media in Kazakhstan. The sensational news was brought on Monday by the British Daily Mail. Respublika, an opposition newspaper in Kazakhstan, has been ordered to close by the country's notorious president, Nursultan Nazarbayev, who has controversially hired the former prime minister to advise him. In the article, Daily Mail shines some light on the state prosecutor's lawsuit seeking to shut down a number of oppositional publications and organizations. It is alleged that Tony Blair, who is paid millions by Nazarbayev, is personally responsible for the development. Readers agree. I see Blair is enjoying the company of despicable people like himself. Plenty of time left for them both to rot for eternity in hell. Was this Tony's idea? Hope the taxman makes a note of his fee. Aksana Makushina, the deputy editor-in-chief of the Golos Respublikian newspaper, believes Blair is not the most crucial factor influencing the current wave of repressions. <laughs> It's amazing for us that a person hailing from democratic UK agreed to advise this odious politician, but we doubt that Blair actually advised the ex-independent media or believe that they want to ban us for actively writing about what was happening in Western Kazakhstan in Janozin. Do not be led by employees who demand pay rises and do tighten criminal liability of labor union leaders for promoting for provoking conflicts. These methods were offered as most effective at Astana Samruk Kazana Corporate Secretary's Forum. Our reporters were also there to learn the concept of social justice in the understanding of the big bosses. The speech given to the managers of national companies by the head of Samruk Kazana Fund to Mirzak Shukiev sounded like a safety training instruction. Shukiev advised his subordinates to control the mood of the staff, never raise salaries without a critical need to, and not give in to the blue collars demands in general. With our social policies, many companies are inclined to make concessions while under pressure of the so-called politicians who create commotion among workers. I see how companies tend to raise wages lately, but when do they stop? People should earn their keep. We shouldn't unreasonably increase salaries nor should we allow it to become a political tool. If we don't stick to this, the entire system will collapse completely. The Minister of Labour and Social Security, Serik Abdenov, also added some oil to the fire, saying that the Janozen syndrome might affect over 350 enterprises currently under the risk of labour disputes. Almost a half of all employees in the country no longer content with the wage level and salary areas come exclusively from the oil and gas sector. The minister suggested stepping up penalties for trade unions to cure the situation.
We suggest increasing responsibility of trade unions for creating conflict situations. Unfortunately, sometimes certain actions of our partners also lead to such problems. Therefore, we suggest making amendments to the administrative and criminal codes. It is worth noting that the topic of strikes in the capital was raised with the quickly approaching anniversary of tragic events in Zhenozhen. Other figures also voiced during the forum seemingly showed how the authorities actually prefer to resolve arising labor disputes. In order to ease the tension in 500 companies, the ministry is now planning to cover wage arrears amounted to over $16.7 million, with another $7.6 million remaining due. Continuing on the subject of Kazakhstan's oil dollars, civil society once again wants to know what is going on inside the Future Generations Fund. The government is in the know, and it appears high-ranking officials are content with that secret knowledge. Our reporter warns us not to expect any heated debates around the oil fund capital. Almaty experts attempted to make recommendations for the government to develop an efficient oil revenue management system. Economist Mirwert Mahmutova came up with yet another proposal to raise public awareness on understanding and increasing funds and controlling financial flows. Unfortunately, very little to no information on oil revenue management is revealed to public by the Kazakh government. One of the primary concerns is the financial flow from the national fund of the country to Samro Kazana National Welfare Fund and the Kazmanai Gas National Company. On top of that, tax revenue allocation lacks transparency and delineated procedures. This statement was objected by the national bank representatives assuring that all necessary procedures for financial revenue control were performed. We provide quarterly reports to the government that don't get published on a regular basis. Besides, we perform annual independent audit checks by the big four authorities based on the investment strategy. In his turn, economist Kanat Birintaev wondered why the country needed a national fund accumulating revenue from trading public natural resources. The government keeps referring to future generations, but our children will hardly find use in dollars and bonds. Instead, they will rather need schools, kindergartens and such, meaning that one of the primary fields of concern should be financing social objects. The organizers planned on an ample debate, which in fact caught the interest of only 10 speakers. It was probably due to the tough Monday morning, or a current state of affairs in the country that makes the concept of the Future Generations Fund sound like another useless endeavor. A pilot project to provide housing for orphanage graduates was launched in Kozolodada region. The first floor of the five-story building, built in Astana Micro District, is designated to orphans aged 16 to 23 for a total of 47 people. The upper floors will be occupied by new and old families under the age of 29. Up next is their story. Future railroad worker Azamata Oltaev believes in dreams coming true since his main headache has been solved. The man believes that someday a real house will replace his cardboard model. Once I graduate, I will find a job, start a family and raise a big house. In the meantime, Azamata is happy to have just one room sharing the building with other orphans. For some reason, people believe that we're absolutely clumsy and not meant for a responsible life. Yes, as you see, we do everything ourselves. The new studio in the same building stays busy before the big holiday. To show their gratitude, young men and women are working on setting up an exhibition of their works, all dedicated to the birthday of the first president. They will reside in these apartments till they reach 29, paying only utility bills. The money earned will be used to pay off the mortgage of the future apartment block or some other developments. According to the law on housing, the country's orphans are entitled to be placed on the waiting list for free housing. Yet the system only looks good on paper. In reality, not all of them will ever see the promised housing. Azamat and his friends appear to be quite lucky. At the very least, they already have a roof over their heads for the next decade. Meanwhile, former Karaganda orphan Yevgeny Gribenkov no longer believes the state will ever help him with housing. The only solution to his problem in his eyes is to sell his kidney. Find out how Yevgeny came up with the idea along with our reporters. A resident of Karaganda, Yevgeny Gribenkov, is offering his kidney for sale in desperation as he needs money to buy an apartment. The man says that selling his organs will take much less time than waiting for government assistance. Yevgeny makes a little over $3,000 a year as a locksmith and can barely support his wife and young son. Once posted on the internet, the unusual ad immediately triggered public attention. People from Kazakhstan and Russia propose large sums of money for my kidney, but I have no choice here. Otherwise, I have to break the law to support my family. I cannot get by on my salary. 
Evgeny, his sister and his wife are all orphans, making them eligible for state benefits, but officials fail to include them on the housing distribution list. They just refused to put me on the waiting list on the public service center. They told me outright that I wouldn't get an apartment. Now Evgeny is making his own list of potential buyers of his kidney. He says the competition is high as other orphans from Karaganda are also doing a brisk online business in selling their organs. The man expects to get about $100,000 that he will spend on the new apartment in Karaganda and maybe even a car. He, however, has yet to tell the family about his decision. In turn, officials are fully aware of the situation but say the orphan simply lacks necessary information about the procedure of applying for housing. He should not have turned to public service center for help. Instead, he could have been given all the necessary information in our department, his orphanage, Tanshalpan, or child protection service. Then there would be no need for desperate steps that he's about to make. Department reps promised to do their best to make Evgeny Griminkov give up the kidney idea and put him on the waiting list for housing. For now, his family was offered to stay in a juvenile home. Evgeny, however, is quite skeptical about the promises made by officials and decided to keep his ad live for a while. The patriarch of politics in Kazakhstan, Sedek Balsin Abdildin, turned 75 this Sunday. The first secretary of the Communist Party did not arrange magnificent celebrations for his anniversary. Earlier, Abdildin presented his five-volume five volume work on the establishment of Kazakhstan's statehood in a sort of response to publications by the president and on the president. Abdildin was born in the Semipalatinsk region, graduated from the Kazakh Agricultural Institute to work as an agronomist and researcher, and later became a deputy minister of agriculture. In 1994, he joined the opposition and two years later became the chair of the Communist Party's Central Committee. The patriarch was the major competitor of the sitting president and eventually became a runner-up in 1999 elections. A few years later, the politician joined the Democratic Choice of Kazakhstan and two years ago resigned from the post of the party's first secretary, which was terminated in a year for its relationship to the unregistered People's Front. Abdildin has also wrote quite a few books, including Reality and Myths, criticizing the incumbent head of state. A series of social programs are being launched on the eve of the first President's Day in Astana, for which the city administration promptly allocated more than 830,000 US dollars. Where will the money go is covered in our next report. <laughs> He worked very hard and studied well in school. In addition, he developed the skills of the nation's leader and then became the president. A whole month is ahead until the new year, but Astana is already caught up in holiday spirit. This Saturday, the entire capital will celebrate the first President's Day, and judging by the announcements, there will be plenty of events to attend. It is the right thing to do since we must be proud of the President. Also, as strange as it may sound, we must worship him. Everyone must be happy on a day like this, even those who don't yet realize the significance of their birthday. Meanwhile, the city administration promises unforgettable surprises for everyone born on December 1st. All babies born on this day will get jumpers as presents. The jumpers will bear a special emblem and will come complete with a greeting card featuring Marina Tsvetaeva poetry. Apparently, only the late Russian poetess who died in 1941 had the right lines for such a great holiday in Kazakhstan. On top of that, 150 orphans from the capital will get tablets and sweets as gifts, while the city administration staff will distribute food packages to a thousand low-income families. The food package consists of 50 kilos of potatoes, 25 kilos of rice, 5 kilos of butter and sugar. This should last for some time. According to our calculations, the families will save on a month's worth of groceries. Everyone will get due attention on the holiday, including veterans. 300 of them living in the capital will be given disposable bank cards worth 60 to 120 dollars each. All these social programs dedicated to the day of the first president will cost over $830 million already allocated from the city budget. Interestingly, the city council made the decision on additional funding with just one week to go until holiday. The new presidential standard will be demonstrated to the public on December 1st, announced the president's central communications office on Monday. Its design was amended by Nazarbayev's decree earlier. It is now a blue flag with a golden emblem down the middle, instead of a figure of the SAC leader. The new flag-raising ceremony on December 1st will be dedicated to the day of the first president of Kazakhstan. 
The amount of money that Kazakhstan will allocate for hosting Expo 2017 was also announced during the briefing. The president said that the event needs to be organized at the highest possible level and therefore no expenses will be spared. The total budget is expected to exceed 1 billion euros. A quarter of a million will be used for the infrastructure, communications and exhibition venue itself. In total, around 1 billion dollars or euros will be allocated for hosting the event. MP Deriga Nazarbayeva advises to turn off the TV when you're not watching it as part of a series of tips for residents of Astana to save up. Some members of the Deputy Corps examined houses that went through the procedure of housing modernization. The five-story residential building on the Kushidina Street has gone through a complete overall. The authorities covered the third of the cost and the tenants will have to repay the rest in the next 15 years. For instance, owners of the four-room apartment will be paying around $28 a month. Deriga Nazarbayeva and other MPs were warmly welcomed by the tenants who praised the state program. In return, the parliamentarians gave local residents even more money-saving advices. Why is it on, though nobody's watching it? Turn it off. <laughs> This is all we have time for now. Thank you for watching. See you tomorrow.